Is there anybody there? Said the traveler, knocking on the moonlit door. And his horse in the silence champed the grass of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveler's head. And he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? He said. But no one descended to the traveler. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his gray eyes, where he stood perplexed and still. But only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveler's call. Is there anybody there? And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky. For he suddenly smote on the door even louder and lifted his head. Tell them I came, and, and no one answered, that, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Aye, they heard his foot upon the stirrup, and the sound of iron on stone, and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hooves were gone. So, The Listeners by Walter de la Mer. This is a narrative poem, which means... It means that it's a story, essentially. It's not your traditional, you know, rhyming Dr. Seuss-type poem. It's... Exactly, though there is a rhyme scheme throughout the whole thing, which is A, B, C, B, meaning that every other line rhymes. He kind of still creates a very story-like structure rather than a rhythmic poetic thing um yeah and and the narrative definitely helps you get lost in the poem a little bit more than i think a strict structure would have with this story right especially with you know like the, the traveler and the listeners and and the use of enjambment to right. um just kind of slur everything into this one big story right and um, it is one big stanza as well which is kind of more of like a paragraph format, you know, rather than a poem with like several stanzas that kind of breaks it up and allows the reader to take a, bre a breath between stanzas. Um, another poetic device and literary device that um, De La Mer uses in this poem is imagery. It's everywhere. Um, De La Mer talks about the birds flying overhead above the traveler. Um, he talks about like the moonlight shining down the stairs inside the house. Mm -hmm. um, and because the poem's so ambiguous and because it's so open to interpretation, creating a world that you can visualize is really helpful to allow the reader to even attempt to figure out what's going on in the poem. Because right. without it, I'm not sure either of us would have known what was going on. Right, and it definitely creates I don't know, it allows the reader to relate to the traveler a little bit because he uses things that we are familiar with, like the moonlight and like the starred and leafy sky and the plunging hooves. I mean, you know what a horse sounds like on the pavement. And so by using these things that we can truly envision, we're kind of immersed in this dreamlike world that he creates of the traveler and the phantom listeners. And Which is something De La Mer is famous for, too. Yeah, I mean, the dreamlike dream -like, the dream -like nature of it is created by it being a narrative poem and by him using enjambment to just drag everything into one phrase. And all of the imagery and, and that's imagery, packed in it, there. It creates a story. It's not, it's a poem, but it's a, it's more a story than anything, I, I think both of us felt like. Yeah. And, and the funny thing was, there's so much ambiguity and imagery and just, it's this whole world that... Every time you read it, and every time there's a different person reading it, you're probably going to get a different interpretation of the poem. Right, so each of us kind of were able to take away our own interpretation of this poem because of all the ambiguity that's present throughout the whole thing. Um, and because it's so, because it's so dreamlike and so open to interpretation, um, there's obviously multiple meanings out there with this poem. Uh, the first being that 
uh, the traveler and us, the readers, are the same person, um, and that we're both sort of lost in this weird, you know, talking to these phantom listeners that you aren't really sure if they're there. We're both sort of caught in this dreamlike phase. Both confused and... Right. Uh, but then there's also another theory out there. Yeah, some people believe that the reader and the listeners are actually one and the same, sort of, and that the traveler is speaking to us as the listeners, and because of this, the poem itself kind of becomes this intersection between um, fantasy and reality, which is, again, that whole dream-like thing that Walter de la Mer evokes in many of his pieces, and that whole theme of mortality and life and death and fantasy reality. And I think both of us really enjoyed this poem because there was so much looseness to what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of, we were able to use a lot of creativity as far as figuring out exactly what was happening right. and visualizing it. Because um, there's this larger history implied throughout the whole thing that we were able to kind of play with. Yeah, but I think we really enjoyed this poem. Yeah. and. Uh, Walter Delamere. Walter Delamere. The we listeners, love him. We, we love it. We love him.